Hello everyone, how is everyone doing tonight? Welcome to LCC Live. Um, hope everyone's Wednesday is going well as we get ready for um, Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday. So uh, we're going to pray if you're on. Um, we're going to ask you always to, um, if you're not currently already um, following us on Facebook to do so. Um, to like and send those comments along with those reviews, um, along with um, those reviews and those comments and the testimonies that you may have um, for us to listen to, to um, always seek to prepare with. But we're going to pray. I just want to make sure that um, my sound is okay. So if you guys can put in the comment, Pastor Larry, we can hear you. Well, I see thumbs up. Okay, great. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you once again for being um, who you are, God. We thank you for the love that you've shown to us, God. We thank you for everything that you've done in and through us. But God, at this time, we pray that you would just be at the middle of this time together. And Lord God, that you would uh, get the glory out of it all. That um, you would be glorified, God. That we would be um more like that we become more like you god from your word and that we would eventually god um, always seek to um, grow each and every day into the likeness of christ but god at this time i pray that you would just hide me behind your cross that you allow your word to go forth and that you would allow your son jesus christ to be seen and not me lord god you know that i've studied but i need your strength i prepared but i need your power I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. So silently now, we wait for thee. Humbly I ask for thy will to see, open my eyes and illumine me. Spirit divine, amen. Yes, 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 I've seen the comments, he has risen. And that's what I'm gonna challenge everybody on, everyone on Sunday. When I say to you, he, has, he is risen, the response that we, we give is that he is risen indeed. And, and, and I'm just excited about what's coming up on Good Friday, as we just celebrate uh, the, the, the actual death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But just not just that, uh, that on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, that we're now, and we're also celebrating his rising from the dead with all power in his hands, just as it was uh, uh, prophesied within scripture. So um, um, this is this is the season why, you know, if everyone if anyone ever wants to ask you, why are you a believer? Why are you a Christian? It's because of this time of year, because of what we're celebrating right now. I mean, yes, he had to be born of a virgin. Yes, he had to live a sinless life. Yes, he had to go through all the trials and tests um, and, the, and the tempting um, from everyone around him and did and not sin. And yes, he had to be our sacrificial lamb at the cross. But he didn't just die. He rose again. And, and that's, the, that's the difference of what we celebrate in our relationships being believers or Christians. But today, today, I figured we kind of would move in a little bit into the reason why we are able to celebrate on Resurrection Sunday. Um, yes, he, he rose from the dead, but, but he took something to the cross for everyone. He, he, he took something uh, that no one else could have taken, and that was sin. At the cross, Jesus Christ bore all of our sins. He bore every one of our sins so that we could be seen as justified before God, but that we could also be seen, excuse me, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Whenever God looks at us as believers, as, as born again believers of Jesus Christ, claiming, believing, acknowledging him as our Lord and Savior. And, and that's, um, that's amazing. But, but even though we're seen um, through the bloodshed cross of Jesus Christ, during our lives, there's still a struggle, even though all of our sins were poured out on Jesus at the cross. This is a, there's still a struggle that, that we go through day in and day out. And so today I felt it only appropriate that we would talk about this struggle, um, the, the sin struggle. So, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to James, James chapter one, James chapter one. And we're going to read 
from verses 12 through 15. James chapter 1, um, and we were reading verses 12 through 15 as we seek today to look at the idea of breaking the process of sin. Yes, sin was broken. Yes, sin sin was uh, eliminated. Christ bore all of our sins at the cross. But because we live in this we live this thing called life and we live in flesh that is always pulling us in another direction, opposite of God. Uh, th there's, there's this thing called sin that, that, and a process within sin that I want us to recognize. I really want us to recognize this process of sin so that we can clearly see where we, can, where we find ourselves in this process. And after we look at this process of sin, what can we do to break this process? What can we do to break the process of sin? sin. So please go with me to James chapter 1 verses 12 through 15. James chapter 1 verses 12 through 15 and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And this is what God's word declares. It says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation afterward afterward they will receive the crown of life that god has promised to those who love him verse 13 and remember when you are being tempted do not say god is tempting me god is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else temptation comes from our own desires. Someone say that from our own, from within me, from our very own desires. And what do they do? Which entice us and drag us away. Our desires, our flesh will always seek to drag us away. It says that these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, this is a process it gives birth to death. Verse 14 again, temptation comes, the process, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires, this is a process, give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Once again, today we're going to look at this idea of Breaking the process of sin. So that we're clear. Sin. We're going to define sin today. And actually, I mean, sin is just basically, it's a clear de definition. But sin is defined as any action, word, or thought outside the will of God. It's simple. It's that simple. That word sin is any action, word, or thought outside of the will of God. And, and the thing about sin, and this is where Satan tries to trip us up day in and day out, is that sin is usually dressed up by Satan as something that's attractive, something that's appealing, uh, something that, that, we, that appears to be different than really what it is. But when we, and, and, and I really, really, I, I mean, I, 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 I know within a, without a shadow of a doubt that when we look at this thing called sin, I'm praying that we see it for what it is, for being the, the unattractive, uh, uh, ugly thing that, that will always, when we're in the middle of it, sometimes we're feeling high, but coming out of it, it usually leaves us low. And, and the truth about sin is that we all have the sin nature within us. We all have the sin state that we're born with. Yes, Jesus died on the cross for us. But it's the sin state that's within us that, that we have to always recognize that we're struggling with day after day after day. And, and I want us to understand that this is a process. Sin can be something that just jumps up in front of us. But usually in our lives, sin is a process. And like I said, I want us to be able to see where we fall in this process of sin. 
Where, where is it that we fall in this, this process of this thing called sin? Because we can't just shut our eyes to it. We can't just close our eyes and act like it doesn't exist. I mean, and, 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 and that's, that's the hard part. That's the scary part. Um, when, when I speak with people, whether it be a parent or whether it be just a teenager or whether it be just someone just living their lives, when you're not able to really see sin for what it is and we begin to play with it, then that becomes dangerous. That becomes really dangerous. And I don't want us to live that type of life. My uh, my goddaughter, I have a goddaughter, and um, when she was little, she's old now, she's in her 20s now, but... But when she was younger, we would play hide and go seek. And the funny thing about it is that when we used to play hide and go seek, um, we would play in the house. We wouldn't be outside. And, and I would say, go go hide, and I'm going to count to 10. And she would run off and hide. And, and she was little. She was small, three, four, or five. But she would go into a corner, and then she would place her hands over her eyes and close her eyes as tight as she could. Because in her mind, in her mind, she believed that if she couldn't see me, then I wouldn't be able to see her. And she believed it without a shadow of a doubt that if she closed her eyes tight enough, that, that if she just didn't look at me, that I would not be able to see her. And I wonder at times, do we think the same thing when it comes to sin? Do we sometimes think as though if we just close our eyes to it, if, if we just don't recognize it, that, that, that it won't really either be going on or it won't really exist? Once again, it's a process, James told us, that the desires uh, come into actions. The actions uh, lead endlessly to death. And, and the one thing that I want us to know is that I want everyone that's connected with Christ not to live a dead life. We talked about being living sacrifices a few weeks ago. But I want us to not just live as a living sacrifice, but to be able to say that I live a wonderful life. As a Christian, as a believer, I'm not missing out on anything. But I want us to be able to say that. And us to realize, I mean, to take a real look at this process of sin. So to do this, we're going to take a look at a familiar uh, parable in the scriptures. And this is this parable of the prodigal son. And I believe the prodigal son paints us a beautiful picture of the process and the movement of sin in the life of this young man. There's going to be seven steps. There's seven steps in this process of sin before we jump into the idea of how we can break this process. So we're going to start Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 22. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 22. And we're going to walk through this as we not only look at this process of sin, but also look at how do we break this process? Because I want everyone to be overcomers. I want you to, to know that you are victorious and not victims. And, and to live that type of life, you can no longer, we can't live in the bondage of sin in our lives. Sin holds us captive. It sometimes makes us feel less than when we're supposed to be more than. And, and, I, I, and that's, the, that's the type of life that I want us to live as believers. So let's look at Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 11 through 22. And remember, we got seven points. If you're, if you're writing, taking notes, or if you're going back, just get your notepad together. Because I want you to go back and look at these yourselves and see, uh, you know, to make you see where are you, where are you if you're in this process. So that you can be honest and not closing your eyes. To the reality of life. Luke chapter 15, 
Verse 11, it says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus was giving out these parables. He first talked about the lost sheep. And then secondly, he talked about the lost silver. And now he's talking about the lost son. These are my, I call them my three S's. The lost sheep he speaks about in, 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 in verses one through seven. In verses eight through 10, he talks about this lost silver coin. And lastly, he talks about the parable of this lost Son, it says to illustrate the point further, Jesus is always building and he's always using parables, stories uh, that were not real, but stories to dig deeper, to show and to, and to teach a deeper point of what he was trying to show uh, through, through the life of a believer, through his life. It says to illustrate the point further, Jesus said and told them this story. He said a man had two sons. The younger son told his father. Now let's 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 just stop right there. The, this is where we find our first point in this process of sin. As Jesus is sharing with them the fact that the man had two sons, and this son tells his father, he's about to tell his father something. Something has gone on. Something has happened. It, usually, it, it says uh, that that that. Out of the mouth, the heart flows. So, so, so something was going on that the son was about to verbalize something. Something was going on. And, and, and as sin begins to bubble up inside of our lives, as sin begins to just take hold of more of our lives, the first step in this process that we have to recognize is that the first step in this process is desire. There's going to be all D's, so it's going to be our, our time. These, all these points are going to have D's to them. But it's first is our desire. Something happened between verses 11, where he just had two sons, to the point that this son now is about to share or talk or ask his father for something. For those that know the story, you know what he's going to ask him. But first, sin begins with a desire, a thought that seems simple and possibly even innocent before any word is spoken. Those little things usually are the beginnings points, the starting point. For sin, it's always the little thing. Solomon, um, in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. It says to catch these foxes, the little foxes, because if we don't catch the little foxes, if we don't capture these small desires that are within us, that we're allowing ourselves to penetrate our lives, whether it be through what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we smoke, whatever the case may be, it's these small little desires that grow into bigger things. That They not only destroy the vine and the grapes, that are on the vine, the fruit that's supposed to be produced, but it also destroys the vine, the connection between the vine. And it's the desires, the small things. Genesis chapter three, verse six, Eve, it talks about when, when she saw the tree, these small little, there's a desire. She saw that it was good for fruit, the lust of the fresh flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. And there was a tree to be desired to make one wise, pride of life. It was desire that Eve saw and allowed to come into her eyes. What are you focusing on? What are you watching? What are you watching that's not productive? What are you watching that's not the, the best thing that you know that you should not be watching? I don't have to tell you. You know. But it's those desires that manifest themselves into something larger. And instead of seeing it as being like, you know what, God already spoken to me about this. I should not be moving in this direction. I should not be doing this thing. We look at it as God holding something back from us because God, you know, God doesn't want us to have fun. God doesn't want us to enjoy life. God is always trying to hold back these good things. And that's what the desire begins to do within our minds. That's the very thing that sin tries to accomplish in our minds, but we aren't supposed to focus on those things. We aren't supposed to focus on, on, on what God is, what we feel as though God is trying to hold back from us. I mean, we should be focusing on the good things in, in Philippians chapter four, verses eight, excuse me, Philippians chapter four, verse eight. 
these are things that when these desires begin to come, when these desires begin to uh, uh, come into our lives and, and, and they, they, they begin to try to penetrate our lives, this is what Paul speaks to them about. He says, now, brothers and sisters, one final thing. He says, fix your thoughts. Fi fix your mind. I want you to fix your mind on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. When those desires start to come in, right there, go to Philippians chapter four, verse eight, and, and, and see if the things that we're taking in, if those desires that are coming in, if they're true, if they're lovely, if they're, if they're, if they're of God, if they are worthy of praise, and whether or not those type of things, those type of desires should be pressed out and God's word coming in us to fill us in those empty areas. Or say, God, I need you to come in because there's a desire bubbling up within me and I don't have the power to fix it myself. But it starts off, sin always starts off with a desire. But it doesn't end right there. After desire, the second point in our process, this process of sin, the second point is a, de a decision, excuse me. There's a decision that's going to be made. This desire bubbles up and this decision now prompts us to make a decision. Verse 13, the A portion, it says that uh, the, son, the younger son had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate. Now, before you die, that's a slap in the face. He, he, he knows that he's not supposed to get his inheritance until after the father dies. So basically, he's telling his father that I really, I'd rather you dead and have this money than to have you alive. But he says that I want this before you die. So his father agreed and divided his wealth between his sons, the older son and the younger son. Here comes the decision. He gets what he asks for. Be careful. Be careful what you ask for because you just may get it. Put that, somebody put that in the comments. Say, be careful what you ask for. God sometimes is trying to hold things back and we're so we're fighting so hard to, to, to go down this lane or, or to do this thing. God is saying, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to go there. But be careful what you ask for because you just may get it. So the father gives him an inheritance, inheritance or gives him his the state that's due to him that's not even actually due to him yet. But he gives it to him, verse 13, the eight portion. A few days later, this son packed up all his belongings. A decision was made. He, he's gotten his inheritance. And now the decision is made after that desire, that thought that comes into his mind. And it's not a God-guided decision. It's a flesh-fulfilling decision. It's a, it's a flesh-driven decision. That decision that he makes it's not one that's God guided. When that desire comes, we do have a decision to make. We can either make the right decision or the wrong decision. We can either turn that station off or we can continue to watch. We can continue to entertain that conversation with that person that know that you know that's pulling you away from your marriage or you can choose to cut that relationship off. You can choose to say that I'm going to continue to look and, and, and possibly steal or lie and cheat or you can make a decision to say I'm going to stop this right now. But the process of sin is desire and then after that there's a decision that's going to be made. You can't play around with sin long enough without a decision being made. But it doesn't stop there. Once again, this is a process. We have our seven steps. We have our desire, that thought that comes into our mind. We have a decision that's made. We make a decision because of this desire's thought. This thought that's not a God-given thought, but it's a flesh-fulfilling thought. But now, after this decision is made, the third point is 13, verse 13, the B portion. It says, after he had packed up all of his belongings, then he does something. He said, and he moved to a distant land and there and there he wastes all of his belongings in wild living the third the third point the third part of this process of sin is that after that there's going to be a distancing that happens 
there's going to be a distancing that happens. It says right here that he moved to a distant land. After our decision to sin, we begin to distance ourselves from God's way and from God's will. We, 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 we happen to say that there's, there's, that we, we, we've now made a decision that we know that we're going down this path. And now we begin to distance ourselves from God. God doesn't move. God stays exactly where he is. We're the one that move. We move away from him. We move away from his calling on our lives. We move away from the purpose that God has placed within our lives. We move away and we begin to distance ourselves from God, whether it be out of shame, whether it be out of heartbreak, whether it be out of disappointment, we begin to distance ourselves from God. And then once we begin to distance ourselves from God, it becomes harder and harder to find our way back home. I mean, I hear people say all the time that they, they distance yourself from God for such a long time. They say that, hey, listen, won't you come on out and, um, you know, worship with us one Sunday? Oh, you guys don't want me in church. You know, the, the, the moment I walk in the church, the, the, the walls would fall down or, or I get struck by lightning. Those type of words are from individuals that feel as though that they're so far away from God that there's no way in the world that God could ever love them. But that's not the type of God that we serve. Pastor Jeff spoke about this. He said, we don't serve a God that's out there waiting to get us back for something that we've done. Now, yes, and I've always said this, there are always consequences, good and bad, to anything that we do. But God is not out there seeking to get us back for anything that's going on in our life. God, we serve a God that seeks to resolve and to restore the relationship that we have with him. That's the type of God that we serve. That's the type of God that, that, that we that, that that we call ourselves to be into relationship with. And there's nothing, there's nothing. I mean, it it, it it's it's said in Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, verses thirty-eight through thirty-nine. It says, I am convinced. Now this is like this is the this is the reason why we have to have God's word deep in our hearts, to have access and be willing to run to it. It's I'm convinced. When I feel that distance happening, I am convinced that there's nothing that can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing. Someone put in the comment, there's nothing, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The distancing that happens, it happens because we, we become ashamed of what's, what, what, what we've done. And that distancing is not relying on going back to God's word. Understand that, that there's nothing, nothing that you can do can make God love you any less. Nothing you can do that can make him want to say that I do not love you, that I don't want the best for you. But our lives, our finite minds can only think about the idea that that, that if I've done something, then that other person is probably trying to do something in return and to get me back. But that's the distancing that happens in our life, in this process, in this process of sin. So we have the desire, we have the, 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 the actual decision, we have the distancing. And then verse 14 gives us our next point. Verse 14, it says, about that time, about the time when his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He began to starve. The fourth point in our process of sin is discouragement. And discouragement. Well, at first it was fun. I mean, he was he was wilding out. I mean, it was attractive, balling, spending, partying, all these different things. But that's when everything begins to, to come to the surface and sin begins to show its face as being really what it is. And that's being ugly. This process is ugly. Sin is ugly. Satan is ugly. He is not for you. He is against you. There's nothing within Satan that is for you. He wants to see your demise. 
And, 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 and that's exactly what comes in the prodigal son's life. He had friends. He had money. He had everything going on. But a famine swept and listen. And he began to starve. At this point, at this fourth point, we, we, we see how, how this thing called sin, it attacks us in three different ways. We have this process, but it also attacks us in three different ways. And it's in this step of discouragement that we see the first way that sin attacks us. And that in this stage of discouragement, in this stage or when, 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 when sin attacks us, it attacks us through discouragement. But first, it attacks us through the discouragement of physical attacks. The physical attacks on our body. Our body begins to want more. Uh, if, if, if anyone has been addicted or, or, or had things addicted, now it doesn't make a difference what it is. It could be drugs, it could be shopping, it could be uh, pornography, it, it, it could be um, whatever the case may be. So people are actually, there's addiction to people that actually are addicted to stealing and cheating. These things that just, they just do, they're addicted. They, they're addicted to, the, to, to, to feeling that, that way. But it's a physical attack that comes on your body and your body begins to go into a state of want. I grew up in the 80s and crack was huge. Crack was huge during that time. And, and, and I saw friends that I went to high school with, male and female, being turned out by this thing called crack. People that, that, that were great and good people, but the physical attack that crack cocaine had on their lives, began to pull a physical want out of them that was opposite of God. And they began to do things. They, they began to prostitute their bodies. They began to live lives that were contrary to the lives that God wanted for them. It's a physical want when you get in that state of discouragement. You just feel low. You don't feel as though there's any promise. And you just continue to say that I have to do this to get through the day. A physical discouragement. That's the physical attack that happens under these, this fourth step of discouragement. But once again, it doesn't end there. I really wish that it just ended right there. But once again, like I said, sin and, the, and Satan seek to destroy every part of your lives. And so the fifth part, the fifth process, point of our process, is found in verse 15 through 16. Remember, okay, let's go back through them. We have the desire. We have a decision. We have a distancing. We have a we have discouragement. And now verse 15 through 16 give us our fifth point. It says here, it says, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The man, the young man, became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good. But no one, all of his friends, no one, it says, no one gave him anything to eat. The fifth part, the fifth part of this process is defeat. After you're discouraged, after that physical attack happens on you, you feel, you feel defeated. And these were the second two points of attack. They, they jump in right at this part of defeat. It, it's us living outside of God's will. And, and, and when, when we live outside of God's will, I can guarantee you that defeat is definite. You will definitely come to a place of defeat because we're living and choosing to live without him. When, when, when in fact, God wants us to live with him. We, he, he wants us to, to, to understand that, that he... He, he wants to be in, in our lives, in our mess. He can handle it. But that, that life of feeling defeated, feeling that, that there's no way, that's, that's that hopelessness that, that many times in life leads to, leads to suicide, a defeated life. But John 10.10 10 says that, and this is how I know that Satan is not our friend. John 10.10 10 says that the thief, he's Satan's thief, Satan's a thief. <clears throat> the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his purpose. But I come, Jesus, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. God does not, Christ does not want you to live 
a victim life. He wants you to live a life of victory, to know that you can be victorious and not defeated. Believers, Christians, brothers and sisters, I want you to really understand that. I want you to, to lock on to that. Because again, that, that defeated life will cause us to pull away from God. That defeated life will, will cause us, like I said, to live without God. But but in Proverbs 18.10, it says that, that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Someone write in, in the comments that God, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous, not because we're righteous in and of ourselves, not because we deserve it, but we're righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We're righteous because of what Christ did for us. But it says the righteous run not away from it, but it says the righteous run to it and they are safe. When we're defeated, we continue to run away from the Lord. But it says right here that, that to, 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 to be covered by God, to live a victorious life, we have to understand that God is our strong tower and that we are to, we're supposed to run to him and not away from him. But like I said, these, these next two areas of attack happen right in this point or is this process of defeat. The, the first one that we see in verse 15 is that it's a spiritual attack. Remember, we had the physical attack that happened. That's a physical one, the flesh. But the second attack that happens on our body in this process of sin that happens to us is a spiritual attack. In verse 15, it says that he goes out and he's feeding the pigs. This story is about a young Jewish man. And if anyone knows anything about the Jewish culture, they are not even allowed to be around pigs. Let alone to, 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 to be a shepherd of them. But he has given away. He's given up all of his beliefs. And now he's submitting himself to the defeated lifestyle. Every part of his spiritual upbringing, he now throws away. I, I wonder how many of us have been to that point. We feel defeated and we begin to give up on the very things that we know are right. We know God has told us to do this. We know God has told us not to do that so that we will be blessed. But when we feel defeated, we give up on the very spiritual side of ourselves and we submit ourselves to things that we were never intended to be a part of. So we have the physical attack that happened in our discouragement, but in the defeated section, in the defeated process, there's a spiritual attack, but lastly, there's a social attack. And this is the, this one is really dangerous. In verse 16, it talked about how, how no one gave him that he ran out of food and no one gave him anything to eat. Socially, he was, like I said, he was riding, he was partying, he was having fun. But when everything ran out, there was no one there. That's another trick of the enemy. Satan will always seek to isolate you. Satan will always seek to get you by yourself and away from the very people who love you the most. I'm praying that you are not allowing Satan to do that to you in your life. I pray that you're not allowing Satan to, 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 to move you away from the very people that need to be speaking into your lives and that you're, not, that, you're, that you're not being offended by the things that they're sharing with you because if they love you, if they care for you, if they want to be there for you, they're going to do these things. But sometimes Satan playing with our minds, that desire that begins to bubble up within our minds, he begins to make us look at the things and the people that love us the most and to make us feel as though, that we can't believe them. And socially, we get to pull away from those that are there for us and not against us. Well, we see this defeat happening. But verse 17, verse 17 gives us even more. Verse 17, after the defeat, verse 17, we see this happen. It says that when he finally came to his senses, thank God. Someone say, come, I, I've come to my senses. Thank God that, that we are, have the ability to come to our senses. It says, once he's come to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And I am here dying of hunger. The, the sixth point is that after defeat, 
There's a despair that happens over our lives in this process of sin. We've, we've hit our lowest point and, 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 and God is waiting there for us to come to ourselves. I, I, I call it being sick and tired of being sick and tired. Uh, my father in the ministry, uh, Pastor Taylor, he, he always says that that, um, that 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 when the pain of staying the same hurts more than the pain of change, that's when change can happen. Think about that. Despite, the, the despair. You're being sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm tired of throwing up in the toilet from drinking. I'm tired of waking up in the bed that's not my, my husband or my wife. I'm tired of stealing and, and, and getting caught and going. I'm tired. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. When the pain of staying the same, that hurt, that despair that's happening, when that pain is more than the pain of change, that's when change happens. Because change can be hard. Change is different. And many of us, we don't like different. But change for the better, change for what God has placed within us, change to do things God's way is always the best way. So it's that change that I want us to, to, to seek for, to, to hope for. But in that state of despair, I'm praying that you are able to come to yourself. And lastly, the seventh point, after that despair, Verse 18 and 19 show us what happens. And that verse 18 and 19 tells us, and this is what he says. He says, I will go home to the father. The father is waiting for you to come home. He says, he's thinking this. He says that just as the beginning began off by him thinking these, these, these flesh fulfilling desires, he's now thinking about these God guided decisions. And he says, I will go home to the father and say, father, I have sinned against both you and heaven. Verse 19. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me as a hired servant. The last point in that process of sin, the seventh and last point is desperation. Is desperation. You finally realize that you can't do it anymore. But the great thing about God is that it's never too late. As long as you have breath in your lungs, it is never too late. As long as you have the inner spirit conviction, that's the pulling from the inside out. That's what happened in verse 18, that inner conviction. He says, I will go to the father's house and say to him, he's not talking to anyone, but it's an inner conversation that's going on within his life. He says, I will go to the father and say, father, I've sinned against both you and heaven and you. That's the inner conviction that happens in that point of desperation. I'm hoping that the spirit is still speaking and that it is and if it is speaking that you're listening to that small faint voice but not only is it an inner spirit conviction but it's a holy spirit humbling in verse 19 it says that that, he, that he's willing to say that that i'm no longer worthy to be called your son but in that state that's what sin does to us it makes us feel less than really what we are he says that and i can we please take me on as a hired servant that's an outside humbling. When you're really ready to humble yourself, that's when you're really ready to change, ready to break this process called sin. And hopefully, at that moment of desperation, you're willing to make that change. But not only are we going to look at this process, but real fast, we're going to look at the, the, the ways to break the process. And the prodigal son does it, but also Psalm 51 gives a great picture of this breaking this process of sin. This is David speaking this psalm after his, his sin with Bathsheba. And, and, and this, is, this is David walking through this process the same way that the prodigal son walks through this process. How do we break this process? How do we break this process of sin in our lives? Well, first and foremost, we have to awaken and accept the Father's mercy and the Father's love. We have to be awakened and not only be awake, but accept the Father's mercy and his love. Verse 20, Luke 15, 20, verse 20, the A portion. And it says that in A portion, and he arose and came to his Father. We have to be willing to say the Father is there. 
that he's waiting for us. And we have to acknowledge that. And we have to take some, he, he physically arose and was determined to go to the father. David says this in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, we're looking at verses one through four in comparison to Luke 15. We see in Psalm 51, uh, the first, first verse, the A portion, it says, this is David saying, David says, have mercy on me, God. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, awaken and accept the Father's mercy, but also accept the Father's love. God's mercies are the reason that we're able to be here. It says, Lamentations 3.22, it says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Then we look at God's mercy. God withholding the things that we deserve and the fact that his love, which is his grace, him giving those things that we don't deserve, which is salvation. When we awaken and accept the mercy and love of God, we begin to break that process of sin in our lives. But not only do we, are we to awaken and accept the Father's mercy and love, but secondly, we have to, secondly, allow God to be who he is. Someone put in the chat, someone put in the comment that just let God be who he is. Allow God to be God. Luke, the 15th chapter, the 20th verse, but the B portion. It says, when he was still a great way off, he saw, the father saw him. The father was looking for him. The father is looking for us in this process of sin. He sees us and he's looking, he's watching every day. He's looking for us to make that turn, to come back to him. He says that when the father saw him, he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, now that, that word ran and he ran to him, it was kind of thrown in there. But if you know the, the, the at the time, the logistics at the time, a father would have never ran to a son, especially a son that had done what he had done to him. But the father loved him so much that, 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 that the, the rules, the regulations, they were all out the window. God is not a God that can be confined to rules and regulations. Let God do exactly what he has to do. He said that he ran to the son. He didn't wait till the son got to him. He ran to him and fell on him and kissed him on the necks. Luke I mean, excuse me, Psalm 51, 1, the B verse, the B verse, excuse me, into the verse 2. This is what David says about this. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Let God do what only God can do. Only God can cleanse us from our sins. Remember the, the verse in scripture when they said that only God can forgive sins. Yes, only God can forgive sins. And that's why Jesus was able to say that I forgive you of those sins because he was God. Let God do what he has to do. And he's not going to always do it the same way each and every time. Three times in scripture, God healed people of blindness. In Mark, Matthew chapter 9, he touched the man. And he was healed. In Mark chapter 8, he spat on a person's face. And on John chapter 9, he spat in the dirt and made clay and rubbed it on the man's face. Each and every time, these people were healed from their blindness. But God did it a different way each and every time. Let God be who he is. Let him do. Because what he's doing for you may not be the same way he does it for me. And how he does it for me may not be the same way that he does it for you. But we have to be willing to let God do what he has to do. God is willing to come to you, to run to you. I know we sang the song, run to the father, but the father is also willing to come to you, to come exactly where you are and, 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 and say, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. Come back, come back into the fold. I'm tired of you being out there living your life in sin. Psalm 32, verse five says, finally, I've confessed all my sins to you. And stop trying to hide my guilt. When we stop trying to hide our guilt, like Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they, they made fig leaves. They tried to heal, to hide it themselves. He says, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Stop trying to hide your guilt. Jesus, God, they are okay with it. They want to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. They're there for you. But we have to let God do what only God can do. We have to... Be willing to do that. Thirdly, to break this process of sin, to break this third part, I mean, to break the process of sin, we have to acknowledge our sins before God. That's what you just said in that scripture before. We have to now, we have to acknowledge our sins before God 
But more importantly, we have to let them go. Luke chapter 15, 21, the A portion. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned. I acknowledge that I've sinned. I acknowledge that I've done wrong. I acknowledge that I was in the wrong. And late, and, and after that, I have to be willing to say, God, I, I have to let these things go because you've let them go. But I have to let them go. Psalm 51, the third verse. David saying, walking line in line with the prodigal son, he says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He's saying that, 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 that I'm always going to remember the things that I've done, but I'm not living in what I've done because God is able to, to, to look past your past. And we have to be willing to do the same. Isaiah 43, 25, this is I, even I am he that will blot out your transgressions. And for my own sake, I will not remember your sins. God doesn't remember your sins. So we shouldn't be holding on to them often, weighing us down, keeping us locked in this process of sin. And the last way, the last part on how we are to break this process of sin, we always have to remember, and this is very important this right now, if you've got nothing else during this time together, I want you to remember this, that you always have to remember that our sin first, someone say first, someone put in the comments first, our sin First offends God. That's really the, the, the deepest part of this time. That, that our sin, if we recognize, it doesn't make a difference whether there's a room for people, whether the, the, there's, there's, there's only two people in the room or whether I'm there by myself. My sin first offends God. Luke 15, 21, the B portion. It says, and this is the prodigal son saying, against heaven, listen, he says, after he, he, he says, Father, I've sinned, he says, against heaven and in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He says that not only have I sinned in your sight, but I've sinned against heaven. What does David in Psalm 51 verse 4 say about this? He says in verse 4, the A portion, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. The way that we break that process is always understanding that whether, whether someone's there with us or not, that our sin first offends God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. But sometimes we think that he's only in a building. When this, when this pandemic hit, and, and churches weren't allowed to, to, to operate and be in service. Many people feel that we weren't having church any longer. But church isn't a building. Church, we're the church. Now, is there a value in coming together as an assembling? Yes, it says forsaking not the assembling of the saints. There, there's, there's, there's a benefit of doing this. But knowing that God is everywhere. And that when I sin, he's the first one that I offend. This helps us to stay focused. This helps us to stay on course, just as Joseph did. Now, now, when many people look at the life of Joseph, many people line up the life of Joseph with Jesus because they were very, very similar. Um, they, they were loved extremely by their father. Uh, they were hated by their brethren. They were sold for silver. And they saved millions of lives by the sacrifice that they made in their own lives. But Joseph understand, understood this idea of first and foremost that when I sin, I sin first against God in Genesis chapter 39, verse eight through nine. And this is where we're going to end tonight. Joseph was being harassed. Uh, uh, there were no sexual harassment uh, HR departments at this time, but he was being harassed by Potiphar's wife. He, he's risen from, from prison, uh, from, from slavery, up into the being the next in charge of Potiphar's house. Potiphar says, over the entire house, you have, you have dominion, you, you have reign over except my wife. And, 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 and Potiphar's wife sees David as being, I mean, excuse me, seeing Joseph as being attractive. And, and, and she tries time and time again to, to get Joseph in the bed. But in Genesis chapter 39, verse 8 and 9, this is what Joseph says. And like I said, I want you to latch on to the idea that we first sin and we offend God in our sin. And this is Joseph speaking. He says, but Joseph refused. And this is what he said. He looked, he's told her. 
My master trusts me with everything in his household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? Listen, it would be a great sin against God. Joseph didn't say that it was going to be a great sin against Potiphar. He didn't say it was going to be a great sin against the people. At the, it, no, he said that it was going to be a great sin against God. If you want to break this process of sin, I think that's that, that, that last point is probably one of the most important points. That when we start to travel down that process of sin and we begin to not just have the desire, but making those decisions that when those decisions uh, become uh, us distancing ourselves from God and that process begins to go on to say, to, to just, just to stop at that moment and say, I'm offending God. My sin first offends God, whether anyone knows it or not, whether anyone can see what you're doing or not, that my sin first offends God. Well, I, I thank you for spending your time with me tonight. I hope that you got something out of this, of our, us looking at breaking this process of sin. Once again, I'm one, asking that you would share this to your page, that others will be blessed. Because I believe that, that you know, we're coming into Good Friday and the fact that sin was poured on Christ at the cross and that at, 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 at Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that Christ rose from the dead and he rose with all power in, our, in his hands. Understanding that, yes, our sins were forgiven at the cross, but also we live lives that continually pull us in the wrong direction. And that when sin comes, don't run away from God. Run to God. It's a process. It's something that we all struggle with. And I think that as we seek to break this process of sin and share it with others, that we not only change our lives, but we change our family lives, we change our community, we change our world, our nation and our world. Well, thank you once again. Once again, on Friday, if you are not doing anything good Friday evening, go online, go to lifecommunitychurch.net. We ask that you register or that you would um, email us at office at lifecommunitychurch.net. And we would love to have you come to our Good Friday services. It starts at 6. The service includes a meal, but we're going to have six phenomenal speakers. We're going to have a, a, a mini skit. We're going to have spoken, a, a, a chapter of scripture being recited uh, as Christ would have recited it. We're going to have a time of communion. It's going to be an amazing time starting at 6. Uh, we have a choir. We're going to be singing together, lifting up the name of the Lord. But I'm praying that if you're not doing anything on Good Friday, this Friday, from six to approximately eight, we're gonna have a phenomenal time of, of, of sermonettes, preachers, food, and fun. And then on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, if you're not going anywhere, we would love to have you come back. 10 o'clock, we start our services 10 o'clock on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. The choir will be singing again and then we have a special uh, 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 treat. Our children will be singing with the choir. So I hope that you're able to come out. But if you're not able to come out this week, we would love to have you any week. Remember, follow us, like us, send your comments, your testimonies. We want to read them. We want to hear from you. Just know that we're praying for you, whether we know you by name. We want you to continue to, to live a life where you're breaking this process of sin. I want you to, to stay safe. I want you to be blessed. But I also want you to always remember to be a blessing. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you once again for being who you are, God. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the fact that you are the good father that's waiting for us to come back to you, no matter how far we may have pulled away from you, God. That you love us so much that it says that you gave your only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him or believes in him should have everlasting life. I pray that, that our lives will be living examples of that. Lord God, I pray that, that you will get glory out of our lives, that you will get glory out of everything we do say and think. Lord God, have your way today. Be blessed, be glorified, and we will give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Closing. 
if you, if you're watching right now, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you never said, Jesus, I, I, I'm, I'm messing this thing up. The sin is dominating my life. I need to break this process. Well, first and foremost, you have to have something living within you that's greater than the thing that's living outside of you. This is greater than he that is in me, than he that is in the world. And that greater is Christ. So if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never spoken the words or, or prayed the prayer, 